This is Lucia Cifarelli from KMFDM, and you're listening to We Go to Eleven. Uh, Why don't you just make ten louder and make ten be the top number and make that a little louder? These go to eleven. This is going to be one of the most bizarre interviews ever, I think, because guess what? I have a bird in my hand that just hit my uh, window. Um, oh my god! And it didn't break its neck, so it's oh look, it's moving its head. So I'm holding it because I've gotten into this. I guess I figured out how to kind of keep these things alive. It's snowing outside, and it smashed into the window. And look at that! It looks like he's going to make it. But anyways, you want to give, you want to give him some water? I already did. Yeah, I got him water or it, it, her, whatever it may be. But, uh, but yeah, it's, uh, it's alive. So I, I think after we get done with this, I'm going to try to see if it'll fly off or whatever. But uh, how about that? How is that for bizarre? Do you want to call me back? I mean, I don't want to put oh, no. you under. No, we're good. We're good. Yeah, yeah, no, we're good. So, hey, so thanks for your time. I know uh, the opportunity came up to talk to you about uh, the new record. So yeah, let go. And uh, you guys have a spring tour. And um, you're going to be in our neck of the woods. I think you're, you we're the second date on the tour. So we're, you'll be hitting Portland, Oregon. And I think yeah, you wind th yeah you wind things down in Seattle. So yeah, I don't well talk to us a little bit about the record because you know one of the things with a lot of the um, uh, legacy bands, you know they they've kind of stepped away from making records. I think their thought is well people don't listen to them, they download or they stream. I guess now um, why why go in that direction? I mean I like it. I like the fact that you guys are making records because I think there's something to be said about the, you know, body of work versus, you know, two, three tunes. Well, we're a bit old school in our approach. You know, we started out in the business making albums and it's important for us to create a full picture of the artwork. You know, it's, it's, we're not single oriented Sasha conceptually realizes in his mind like the book ends the beginning of a record and the end of a record and then we kind of fill it in with all of these ideas so it's more of an experience I think we're the kind of band that conceptually uh, lends itself to album oriented material rather than just singles right and you know with a band like uh KMFDM. I mean, what's how do you guys uh create these tunes? Because you know, I think uh in some bands it's it's like the key songwriters, maybe a couple people. Um, you know, is it all fresh stuff? Is it stuff that you kind of just shelve for a little bit and going, hey, we like that, but we're we're gonna revisit that down the road? How does this all work? Well, it's it's all of the above, you know, because we're creating all the time. I mean, we we're not um we're not the kind of artists that decide to make a record once every five years and put our heads down and do it. We're making music every day. So Sasha starts his day, goes upstairs in the studio and starts creating, um, coming up with ideas. And, and sometimes those ideas get shelved and revisited on a, le a, le a later record. Mm -hmm. um, you know, he'll come up with ideas and then they'll, find their way to me or I'll hear him working on something and I'll say, Hey, I love that. Can I right. have that? <laughs> nice. Um, and yeah. And then, you know, he'll start something, he'll toss it my way. I'll work on a lyric and a melody and then maybe it inspires something else for him. And then yeah. he'll throw it towards our drummer and our guitar player and they'll come up with bits and pieces. Mm -hmm. We don't generally sit in the same room and work together. Mm -hmm. We're kind of all over the place. You know, right. somebody's in Florida, somebody's in New York, we're over here. Mm -hmm. um, but we're always creating and some of it happens to work out on whatever current project we're working on. And sometimes um, we use it for later use and sometimes still there's uh, songs that are already out there that we put a new spin on that Sasha will say, mm -hmm. Hey, I'm re-inspired by this all over again. And I'm going to mm -hmm. reimagine it like we did on this record right. with world. Right. Three. Yeah, yeah. 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 
so has there ever been a time because i know you know i think the a lot of the industrial bands kind of have been making records in this way in terms of not being in the same uh studio in the same room or maybe have their own studios at home right so it's kind of been common practice i think for the for a lot of the industrial uh acts and stuff like that but you know a lot of the rock acts are now getting into that uh into that mindset a lot of times with them the chemistry isn't quite there like you can tell you know that that they weren't in the same room it's like wow this is a good song but it's missing something right um how do you guys go about um you know when you when you're creating to make it sound like hey th this is going to have that energy it's going to have that power it's going to have that charisma that's a very good question i think first and foremost i want to say i know that it's hard for people to kind of step aside from this idea, but we don't really see ourselves as an industrial band. You know, we, Sasha coined the phrase ultra heavy beat for a reason, because it incorporates so many different genres. Yeah. And we're always playing with genres. I think one of the reasons that um, we have this consistent energy to what we put out is because you know, we've all been doing this a long time. We're all very good in our own right. You know, I'm I'm focused as a as a writer. I've been writing since I'm 14 years old. Sasha and I have the ability to work together because we share the same space. Uh, so we're constantly fine tuning and and um, you know critiquing each other. And it's it's also comes from working together for a long time all of us this this version of the band so we're pretty tight you know and we rehearse together and we do a lot of live shows and it just it works yeah so talk a little bit about that because you know it it you know when you've had that opportunity to gel for a number of years you know there is kind of like this seamless thing that happens you know in the live setting uh how long did it you, do, would you say it got to that point where you're going hey we really got something here where you know we really gelled um and and it's really seamless and you know the the you know part of it is the audience picks up on that and you guys can feed off of that well i think a lot of it has to do with appreciating the music itself, you know, so when we, when Andy Black Sugar, for instance, our newest addition to the band joined, I think, I believe it was 2017. It was, um, I mean, he, he, it was really feet to the fire for right. him because we had a tour scheduled with some other musicians that we had played with in um, Europe for a European tour because we were going through a transition with band members. Mm -hmm. And we had scheduled just a couple of days before our first show with Andy to rehearse. And there were so many technical problems in the rehearsal studio that we never got to rehearse together as a band with him. And when we got to the first show, which was a festival, the front of house guy that we hired didn't know how to work the board. Oh, so no. all the bands that were scheduled to play were sitting around like biting their fingers oh, wow. when they get to sound check. So the very first show that we ever did together, we never even actually oh, played. Wow. Oh, geez. <laughs> that, and, and we killed it. We did a really good job. And right. I think that created an instant bonding and we a very uh, intense closeness after we successfully were able to do that show together. Mm -hmm. um, but Andy Selway, our drummer, and Sasha and I have all been playing together for my gosh. I I joined the band. Um, I've been working with Sasha since 1999, first mm -hmm. in MDFK and then in KMFDM. And right. when I joined KMFDM, that was Andy Selway's first tour. So. You know, do the math. It's a long time. Right. Yeah, it's been a bit. <laughs> so we feel comfortable together at this. At Does this it point. feel like it's been, you know, since 1999? Because, I mean, I know sometimes, you know, years just kind of fly by, especially if it's, you know, a, a, a good situation. I mean, I'm guessing this has been, seem, uh, you know, something that's been really kind of like, uh, you know, it seems like it's probably been like yesterday, maybe for you. 
Some days it feels that way. Other days, <laughs> not all the time. <laughs> when we're on a tour bus for a month, yeah. it feels like we. Well, I guess I guess you'll I guess you'll have you'll have a report on that, you know, once you guys do this North American tour. <laughs> so so as far as with the North American tour, I you know, like I said, you guys will be playing in Portland, Oregon the night, you know, the last uh the night before the tour ends. I think it ends yeah. in Seattle, from what I recall. Is that, um, is that, is that the Yeah. I have to yeah. double. So you know, with the with the uh, with the touring, is there a particular city or cities that you look forward to performing at the most? And oh, I you know what I don't. I'm an American girl. I'm originally right. from New York, and right. I moved to Hamburg, Germany, right. um, with Sasha when he relocated. And I don't get back home very often, so uh -huh. I look forward to going to every city. So you know, I'm yeah. looking online. For all the mom and pop restaurants oh, nice. and places I specialties here, there, you know, I'm gonna have my Baja fish tacos in oh. San Diego. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> <laughs> I'm gonna have my pizza in New York or right. cheeseburger, or whatever. So I I really and I'm gonna see friends here and there, and I'm we're gonna get to be on stage and and reconnect with our fans. So I look forward to it. I love being on stage. Nice. It's where I hope that the songs come to life. Mm -hmm. You know, when people listen to these records, they close their eyes or right. they dance around and they have only one side of the experience. But mm -hmm. when they come to a live show and they can see and feel the energy in person, um, there's something right. next level that, yeah. you know? Yeah. No, that's true. I'm looking and, and as far as you know the set list i mean the the band goes back to about like i think 1984 so i mean there's been a lot of material over the years and then there's been material since you have been in the band i mean how do you guys put together a set list because i think you know now it's probably impossible you know like with a lot of the bands that have been around for a bit to give everybody what they want completely right i mean everybody's going to get something it's that possible. they wanted in there yeah so it's impossible <laughs> so is the pressure off when it comes time to do a set list and and how much you know do you look at incorporating material off the new record well that is the priority because we're out there to promote our newest work but of course the body of work that kmfdm has accumulated is so it's there's so much that it's always tricky to decide but you know and we don't always perform everything on the new record we cherry pick the strongest material the ones that are going to create the most energy in the room you know the the ones that are going to keep the momentum going so we usually do that go through the first album and then we go backwards and of course, there's some classics that you can't, you can't not play, you know, like Megalomaniac or Drug Against War. There, there's some songs that we argue with Sasha about because, you know, he's ready to let certain ones go and replace them with newer ones. And we're always like, you know, but there's some of those old ones that are so important to hold on to because they mean so much to the fans, you know. How would you describe a a uh, a typical fan? Because I don't think there is such a thing. I mean, I've I've seen people that are into metal and they're into the band. People that are into pop, they're into the band. People that are into rock, they're into the band. You know, uh, dance music, and they're into the band. I mean, is there a typical goth goth people that are into the band? I mean, it just seems like uh, there isn't a typical a typical fan, right? No. No, there's not. And I'm I'm telling you, if you want to, if you come to the show, where are you based in Portland? Uh, uh, in Oregon. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, outside of Portland. Oh, are you coming to the show or are you too far away? No, we're not that far away. I mean, I think that that that's that's probably on the calendar, I would believe. I mean, it's 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 at the right time of the month for me as far as, you know, scheduling. So I don't have anything else going on for it. Yeah, I don't well, think there's a typical band. We would love to have you as our guest. And then you could see for yourself how diverse our audience is. Right. You know, there's people from all walks of life. Mm -hmm. There is this um, preconceived idea that, that, that we have a certain kind of fan. Right. But we don't, you know, they're... 
they're from every community that you can imagine because it's ultra heavy beat. It's incorporating so many different styles that people relate to it that mm -hmm. come from all different musical corners. Right. Right. So you do this run in the spring. Is there a chance that then what happens? Is there going to be another uh, touring cycle cycle in North America or are you just concentrating on these dates and then doing maybe stuff abroad? Well, we're going to see what comes up. We would we're thinking of doing perhaps a summer tour huh? after this um, or a fall fall tour. We're going to talk to our booking agents and see what ideas they have. Right. Um, we've reached a place in our lives where, um, you know, we're ready to do that. We we had a small young daughter before mm -hmm. in the previous years, and mm -hmm. now she's older. So that frees right. us up to do more touring, and we want to. So we'll see what comes up. Yeah. So I got a couple more things or a few more things uh, not related to the band. Uh, I guess one being like the, I saw something about you doing a Kickstarter for a solo record. So tell me all about that. Yes. Yes. I, and I would really love it if you could mention that. Right. Um, we will. You know, I just, I can give you that, send you that information. Sure. That would help That'd be me great. a great deal. Yeah. You know, when, um, before COVID hit, just before COVID hit, I had this great desire to make a solo record. And then I had all the time in the world to do it, right? Because the whole world shut down. And um, our touring, we were supposed to go on tour and that didn't happen. So Sasha was able to co-produce that record with me. Mm -hmm. And I nice. funded it myself. Yeah. You know, paid the musicians, right. did the photo shoot, did everything. Um, and people really love that record and mm -hmm. I wanted to make another one. I want to make another one and I wrote it. I decided that during the making of the KMFDM record, mm -hmm. I just thought I'd really like to make another record and I was in the flow of writing. So I was quietly writing a record on my own. And, um, then it was suggested to me by my relatively new manager that I should probably consider doing a Kickstarter, but that's a very scary proposition, right? Because then you really find out who right. your fans are. Right, so, right. <laughs> <laughs> you know, everybody says, you have so many fans. Right. I said, okay, we'll see. We'll see who are the real diehards now mm -hmm. who want to um, invest in this follow-up right. record. So right. I, I, I have it's in the pre-launch stage and I plan on launching it on February 29th or at the latest March 1st to coincide with the tour. So mm -hmm. that I'm hoping that right. the people standing in front of me will sure. feel compelled um, because I'm, I'm also, if rehearsals go well, planning to perform one of the songs off the album for the first time. Oh, so wow. oh, cool. there's that. Nice. Yeah. So yeah, we'll plug that if you can get me the direct link and stuff. I think it's on your X account, I believe is where I saw it. But yeah, you know we'll, what? We'll... I just got a better. I I just got a better. Yeah, but it, oh, okay. it's there. Yeah, 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 yeah. I got a QR code so okay. people can cool. like automatically. Yeah, we can do yeah. that. No problem. And one of the other things I was going to ask you about uh, some of your past work uh, with the band uh, Drill. So yeah. <laughs> tell me about that because you know I think as uh, as I. Uh, you know, become fans of, of some of these bands, I go back and I'm like, oh, wait a minute, there's a connection between yourself and uh, Black Label Society, you know? Yes. Yeah. So, <laughs> so yeah, so right. So, so tell me about Drill. Uh, what was the, what was the uh, lifespan of that band and why did it uh, disband eventually? Well, you know, it's a story as old as time, right? A band gets signed to a label. And, okay, let me, I'll, I'll try and make it more interesting than that. Um, we, I was looking for band members when I started out in New York, I, I needed to start a band and I met first my guitar player, Dan, who, um, had recently moved over to New York from Ireland. And, um, we started looking for musicians to play in a band and JD was one of them, John DeServio and Marcus Farney. And then um, we got signed to a production company in New York 
and they got us signed to a and Records, and we put out our first album, which was a self-titled album, toured with Marilyn Manson and Stabbing Westward and God Lives Underwater, you know, a lot of the bands of, at that time uh, the, in, the, in the same genre. Right. And, um, you know, then we went into the studio to make our second record, and we were very excited about it. We had, um, we were assigned to a very famous a &R guy at a and David Anderley, who signed Sheryl Crow and the Doors and like a million other people over the course of his illustrious career. And it was a very exciting time. Right. But then, um, you know, the big five, there was this whole consolidation of labels mm, with right. Interscope and um, and then they looked at the numbers and they mm -hmm. decided that we didn't sell enough records to justify being kept on and the band split up and I, about a year later, got a call from Sasha to, uh, participate in MDFMK. So I mm -hmm. went to Seattle, worked on that. Right. And then after MDFMK, because they were on Republic Records, mm -hmm. I was able to have the ear of um, some of the executives over there. And they heard some of my solo material. And I got signed as a solo artist. And I moved to London to make From the Land of Volcanoes with Ian oh. Stanley, was previously in Tears for Fears. Right. Yeah, and I he oh, was wow. a keyboardist in Tears for Fears. So I spent um, about a year in London. That didn't work out because <laughs> for a lot of reasons that, you know, it just happened to everybody. The time you get signed, the excitement that, that's generated by the time you deliver your album, sometimes things, the landscape has changed and things don't work out. So that didn't work out over there. And then I jumped right back into KMFDM mm -hmm. because Sasha was reforming KMFDM and right. I've been there ever since. Nice. You know, what was interesting about the, about the band, the drill is that they wound, you wound up on A&M, which isn't really known for, for that style of, of music. Right. I mean, I, it always seems like there was always some band that, you know, got picked up by some label and you're like, well, they didn't do enough to really promote it. I mean, I, I know well, what it, it came down to like not enough units sold, but it probably was pro also something related to probably not enough promotion to get those units sold. Well, well, the thing is, is that um, we got signed to a production company by a producer in New York by the name of Rick Wake, who was a very, very popular producer at that time. And he had a diverse, I mm. mean, so many different types of artists in right. his production company. And then and he started a label. He started right. it within Deviate mm -hmm. Records, within a right. and He was yeah. able to release the artists that he believed in, which spanned mm -hmm. the map. He ah. had rock acts. He had dance artists, he had soul artists. So he was able to put everything that he believed in and invested in through AM Records. Mm -hmm. And AM was very supportive. It's just that when the restructuring happened, AM was absorbed into Interscope. Mm -hmm. Right. You know what I mean? So AM yeah, yeah. became more of an imprint. So loads of people that believed in these artists that were signed to his label were fired mm. they right. didn't exist anymore right right and i don't know about you but i don't know a lot of a and r people that want to take on artists that they themselves didn't sign right right sure <laughs> yeah so. yeah no i mean it, it go, it, the same thing goes with like sports you know you get a new coach head coach coming in he's probably gonna clean house as far as any of the assistant coaches you know it's like bye guys you know, I'm going to bring yeah, in my own people, people, right? If, so, yeah, yeah. But if we had sold over a million mm -hmm. rats, I'm sure, oh, sure. we would have a oh, fan. Yeah. 
Sure. <laughs> so I guess they, in, in short, they just didn't have the patience to develop the band. And, and, you know, it's weird because now these days there's even less patience to uh, develop a band, you know? Well, everything is so, it revolves around TikTok, right? Right, right. You've got enough TikTok views, anybody will sign you. Sure. So, and you don't even have to be a recording artist or a right. musician. You, if right. you've got like, <laughs> if, right. if you're, cute and you can mime and you've got like a bazillion mm -hmm. people, they'll yeah. sign you up <laughs> yeah what a, what a bizarre time we live in right <laughs> it's just like what's, what the hell happened oh it's man but, but but we still love we're passionate about what right. we do right and the thing is is you know why do we just to bring the conversation full circle why mm -hmm. do we bother with albums because that's what it was always about. You know, it was about delivering a, a, an album mm -hmm. of a body of work with right. artwork um, and a story to tell, not sure. just spitting something out and right. trying to gain views. Sure. Yeah. And that's, that's kind of my thing is I'm into the albums. I'm into the physical stuff. I'm more still a CD guy. I mean, I think with the vinyl, it's like, I get it, you know, but I've already been there. I don't want to go back and <laughs> buy everything all over again. You know what I mean? So I, I'm sticking with one format and that's what I'm going with. Obviously I do streaming, streaming as well, but that's not my preference. Yeah, um, I mean, it's impossible not to these days, right? Right. right. You got to do it, you know, even But you only car. truly support the artist when you buy right. mm -hmm. the CD or, or, or the album. A, yeah, the right. vinyl. Yeah, right. So, <laughs> so the last thing I have for you, and look at this, the bird came live. He's like ready to fly off. So really? uh, the last, yeah, I mean, I, I, I think I got this <laughs> figured out with these birds. I'm, if you rub their head and they didn't break their neck, they'll eventually come back after you give them a little water. I'll probably give him oh. a little more, more water and off he goes. But uh, last question I have for you, um, and, and I think you just mentioned a little bit, uh, maybe there's another another moment. Uh, since this is for We Go to 11 and it's got a spinal tap spin to it, and I'm sure you're familiar with spinal tap. Do you have a particular spinal tap-ish type story that you could share here at the tail end? Oh my gosh. Oh, well, uh, we were in Russia. We had flown to Russia to do a show and we had been told that it was going to be this really, this was a long time ago, that it was going to be this real luxury experience. And we were all excited. They told us we, there was going to be Russian caviar and champagne. And we get to the venue. It's summertime. There was a loaf of bread with like 12 slices of bologna and not oh. enough bottles of water to, oh, geez. to, to go around. Uh, we couldn't communicate with anybody that worked there. We didn't have any rubles to go down the street to the McDonald's. Then it was so hot on stage that Jules's amp caught on fire. I got electrocuted oh, gee. <laughs> <laughs> and then they rushed us to the train station and to, so that we wouldn't miss our train to St. Petersburg. And then there was supposed to be champagne and that's where this champagne and caviar oh, was supposed wow. to be. And I got separated from the band. I lost part of my luggage. I was hysterical and when I found the boys, they were all huddled up in what looked like it, it looked like a prison. It was like a, the train was like a prison oh, wow. on. And when the and when the promoter came, he said, "Oh, I'm so sorry about the champagne and caviar, but I have these little baggies, and there was some stale roll and what looked like a can of cat, cat food and oh, a little and a little you know bag of water, and." That that was pretty bad, yeah. you know. <laughs> that is pretty. Out of curiosity, did you taste the bologna, and did it taste like the stuff you'd find in the United States, or no? No, it did not. It didn't. It did oh, not. Okay. I mean, and 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 we, you know, I think we split the sandwiches in quarters because there were twelve yeah. of us. 
Yeah. If I didn't, you know, the, the food that we did <laughs> have the opportunity to eat when we finally did eat was very good. Right. But everything was impossible by the time when we got to the hotel right. in Petersburg. It was this really beautiful hotel. But when we turned the knobs yeah. on the faucet in our room, brown water came pouring <laughs> out. Oh and God. and then we moved to another room and brown water came out again. And it was it was the most bizarre experience that I've ever had on tour with a band. Yeah. Oh wow. <laughs> so, thank you so much. Hey, that this was a blast.